Thank you. Good evening and welcome. Thank you for coming to our premiere of Ronald Reagan, Rendezvous with Destiny. Newt and I would like to thank Mrs. Reagan and Duke Blackwood for the opportunity to be here with you this evening. We'd also like to thank Dave Bossie, Kevin Knobloch, and the entire team at Citizens United who produced and directed this film. Ronald Reagan believed in America, and he believed in the American people. In eight amazing years, President Reagan rebuilt the American economy, defeated the Soviet Union, and revived the American spirit. Through principled leadership and amazing conviction, President Reagan led our nation from a time of despair to a time of hope. Today, there is a great deal that can be learned about President Reagan and his inspiring story. We thank you for coming. And we hope you enjoy Ronald Reagan, Rendezvous with Destiny. Let me say, first of all, that Duke's introduction, which was not exactly the one we wrote for him, <laughs> reminded me of earlier this evening when Clist and I first got here, and we did Sean Hannity's show from right here. And Duke had decided that he wanted to show off the brand new, and I have to say as an educator, stunningly interesting center that they have for exploration in which young people get to go and play the president, the military, the news media. It's a remarkable facility, I mean, absolutely world-class facility. So I walk in, and they have set up the interview in their version of the Oval Office. <laughs> now, any of you who have ever watched Sean on television know, if you give Hannity an opening, like, oh, hi, Newt, what are you doing in the Oval Office, and how did... You know, it just got worse from there. It was unbelievable. Uh, I'm th thrilled to be here. We've, I've been here many times. And I want to just make one confession. Everything Calista said was right. Uh, without Dave's leadership at Citizens United, we could never have done this. Without Kevin's extraordinary artistry, it would not be anything like the film it is. Without the team they've assembled that routinely does an extraordinary job, and we have done three films with them, we look forward to doing many more. Uh, it's unbelievable. And we did everything we could because we think this is a really important film at a really important moment. And later on after the film, I'll take questions and expand on why I think this is so important. But I want to make one confession to all of you here at the Reagan Library. And it's something which Mrs. Reagan, I think, would fully understand, and anybody who ever worked with President Reagan understands. If you make a 90-minute film about Ronald Reagan and you simply get out of the way and let Ronald Reagan be on film, it is almost bound to be a terrific film. So I would say, <laughs> if Dave and Kevin and their team deserve 8% of the credit, and if Callista and I might claim 2% of the credit, 90% of the credit for what you're about to see goes to the man for whom this library is named. Thank you all very much. What Newt was referring to was the Air Force One Discovery Center, and I'm going to give it a plug right now. It is truly one of our extraordinary opportunities here to educate the future leaders of America. And for those of you who have not seen it, I suggest that you call the foundation offices and we'll try and set up some tours because it really is extraordinary. And thank you, Newt, for mentioning that on Hannity's program today. And by the way, we did not set that up in the Oval Office. That was Fox that did that. 
I don't know what they have up their sleeves. All right, without further ado, let's roll the film. tough not to get a little teary-eyed when you see that, but I think that uh, David and Newt and Callista did an outstanding job of capturing uh, Ronald Reagan and what he meant to all of us and to America and to the world, and I think we can, in our everyday lives, take a look at that and take a little bit of Ronald Reagan with us. Okay, now, I invite the speaker to come up and ask or answer your questions. What we'd like to do is uh, we have people in the audience or in the aisles with microphones because we're recording this. So once I pick on you, if you would, uh, or select you, excuse me, I don't pick on you. <laughs> um, grab a mic and then we'll uh, call on you. Let's start right back there. I think we all were very inspired by the movie, so thank you. Mr. Speaker, I have a question for you. <laughs> we don't have the shining city on the hill that President Reagan left us. I'm afraid that with the way the government is going right now, we're paying people who don't pay taxes, which as I understand is a bribe to get you to vote for someone we have a problem with debt that's going to be a problem for a generation. We have an administration that doesn't believe in uh, a problem with terror and wants to eliminate that dialogue. Uh, we have a problem in communication and speakers. And you are, I consider, one of the brightest people on our side. And I don't really know how to deal with and maybe you can suggest something. One, how to deal with how we transcend this and how we deal with communication because we were beat by the other side when they were technologically much better in transmitting to the younger generation, which will now pay for the debt that we're now incurring. And I don't know if there's a tipping point where if you get 51% of the population indebted to government that they will inexorably vote for that party, which means even if we have better ideas, better people, we don't win. Do you have any comments, sir? Thank you. No, he won't have any comments on that. Do you need some help? Well, Look, Ronald Reagan emerged on the national scene the month before Barry Goldwater was crushed. He was recruited to run for governor at the peak of the Great Society when the future of America was bureaucratic, wealth transfer, democratic, and Lyndon Johnson seemed to be all-powerful. He took on first a popular San Francisco moderate Republican governor who was favored to win the primary, and then a very popular Democratic governor who everyone expected to win. He won the primary decisively. He then beat the Democratic governor by a million votes in a year in which the Republicans were picking up virtually every major governorship, picking up many Senate seats, and gaining 47 House seats two years after Barry Goldwater's defeat. He went on to serve two terms as governor. I first got to see him privately in 1974 as I was running for Congress for the first time in an absolutely idiotic move as a Republican in Georgia during Watergate. <laughs> and. The whole race was worth running because his plane was late and he spent an hour talking to me about how to make speeches. Six years later, after the Republican defeat of 74, remember, he loses the presidential nomination of 76. 
He could easily have gone home. We've thought about writing an alternative history in which the Reagans decide not to run. They're at the ranch. Life is good. He's too old. So in 76, Jimmy Carter wins. Jimmy Carter has the highest approval rating of any president in the history of polling on the day that he is sworn in, much higher than Barack Obama. And he only has one fundamental liability. He is totally out of touch with reality. There's a thread coming here. I can feel it. No, I'm not making any immediate jumps to the current moment of lunacy. I'm describing a historic pattern that is accurate and defensible. Although I do think, for the age of Obama, the most sobering part of this film, if you're a Democrat, is the five minutes in which Jimmy Carter reminds you what a dweeb he was. Uh, <laughs> you begin to think about, I have to tell you one quick story. I cannot resist this. Remember the moment where they show you, this is, a, this is one of the great side effects of this movie, the moment where they show you the gasoline rationing. Now, a few of you may be old enough to remember. When, how many of you remember when you could only buy gasoline on every other day based on your license? Remember this? Well, I was telling this story for a week or two, and Dave Bossie, the head of Citizens United, says to me, I was 13 at that time. And every morning, my father would give me a screwdriver This type, right? Yeah, he was a Republican. Uh, you give him a screwdriver to go out and change the plates so that the car that needed gas that day had the right license plate. Now, I told this story five or six times, and I came up with a brand new test, which you can take back to all of your neighbors, for whether you're liberal or you're conservative. You are a conservative if you believe that a rule has been adopted that is so dumb that 13-year-olds are being taught to break it, and therefore you should repeal the rule. You are a liberal if you believe this story proves that you need license plate police at every gas station. <laughs> so, I, I just, I just want to I'll, I'll finish on this, but I want to make two points that I wish I could drive into the heart of every conservative in the country. The first is, it's never over. Reagan didn't think it was ever over. We got in a big argument with him one time about 1986. And about 10 of us went down there, the younger, you know, the really tough young Turks, and we just beat him up for an hour. And it got pretty rough and tumble. And as we started walking out, he walked over and he put his hand on my shoulder. I mean, Reagan was the kind of guy that if he put his hand on your shoulder, you were like paying 100% attention because you didn't know what was coming. But you, I mean, he just exuded this sense of, of assumed authority that was unbelievable. He looked at me for a second and said, you know, after I'm gone, maybe you guys are going to have to do some work on your own. And you might argue that that was the beginning of the contract with America. But the point is, Reagan, if he were here tonight, would say to you, get over it. You had a bad couple of years. You had a stupid administration balanced by an even dumber Republican Congress. You've got a Republican Party which has lost its mind and has no real skills. You have a Sacramento dominated by interest groups. Okay, so roll up your sleeves and fix it. You're Americans. You're the freest people in the history of the world. What would President Reagan say to President Obama, and what should Obama really listen to? By the way, those are two different questions. You should listen to everything Reagan said. Yeah. What would Reagan really say to Obama? I think he would say that you're clearly very smart, very disciplined, and have a lot of courage. And you have achieved something that's quite extraordinary. 
but that the presidency of the United States is not a political office. It is the leader of the American people and the most important source of freedom on the entire planet. And you are now faced with an 80-year crisis that we've not seen since 1929. And nobody knows how to fix it. Nobody. And a little humility and a little listening and a little coming together might, in fact, be pretty essential to getting out of here. And then you've got to talk about first principles. And this is where I think he and Obama would, frankly, end up in two totally different rooms. Reagan's first principles were belief in the American people, belief in entrepreneurs, belief in science and technology, belief in the opportunity to arouse people to be bigger than they think they can be, to do more than they think they can do, to live out great dreams, to be heroic. And Reagan understood the heroism of a family that's just worked really hard to keep their family together and get their kids through school. The heroism of a 13-year-old who did not get pregnant. The heroism of a 16-year-old who did not buy drugs. The heroism of a 22-year-old who decided they really had to go learn because they were never going to have a decent job if they didn't learn. That's a heroic act in a free society. And I think you would say to Obama, you know, you place your faith in systems that are hopeless. And the one example which I was having fun with Sean about tonight, but I think will become the symbol of this administration, was page 11 of the budget, where they have a chart of two French socialists. And Reagan would have said, you know, you really should fire the people who did this, because this is so dumb, you shouldn't have them near you. It's a great moment. Jim Baker, who did a wonderful job for us tonight, and who's honest about the fact that he was on the other side of the tax issue. In the New York Times story many years ago, they told about Baker being in the cabinet with Reagan and Baker arguing for a tax increase. They'd already gotten, they got the big tax cut of 81, which I voted for. Then they got really two dumb tax, cut, tax increases in 82 and 83, which I voted against. And Darman and Baker had come back to argue for another tax increase. And after he got done making his case, and the economy by now was recovering, and Reagan had regained his sense of morale and, and his sense of certainty. And after Baker got done making some argument, Reagan took his glasses off. And he looked across the table and he said, gosh, Jim, if you believe what you just said, why are you in this administration? <laughs> and Baker supposedly walked out the door, turned to Darwin and said, we will never, ever again talk about a tax increase while he's president. Now, he would say to him, I mean, the, the, the problem Obama has, you know, I don't care how smart you are, if you have the wrong formulas in your head, you're just going to get an enormous amount of trouble. And the smarter you are and the more confident you are, the more trouble you're going to get in if, in fact, your formulas are wrong. And the Obama formulas are, are basically French socialism with a little bit of South Side Chicago ra radicalism with a fair amount of Harvard sophistry. Let's go way in the back with the the young lady with the black dress. Mr. Speaker, um, I was a Democrat, <laughs> and it was during Ronald Reagan's administration when I saw um, things differently that I became a Republican. And then, of course, the contract with America, which you led, I was so proud of to be a Republican. And I was one of the little workers who was always trying to get us in power. And then we finally did get in power. We had a Republican president, Republican House, Republican Senate. And it just fell apart. I saw them as weak and stupid, and I couldn't understand why they didn't fight harder for our core beliefs. And, and now we've got the mess we've got. So I want to know, as a Republican who believes in the principles of our party, as an American patriot who believes in our Constitution and our founding fathers, if we put people in power that are supposedly on our side and they just turn into monkeys, where do we go? 
Well, look, I think that's a, actually a pretty good question. I, it's, it's been 10 years since I stepped out. And for the first five of those years, I really thought a lot about what went wrong. Because as far as I was concerned, it went wrong by the summer of 98. And, and uh, we had a meeting in the late spring of 98 with the Republican Senate leaders. And I argued that we needed a second wave of reform to continue the momentum that we'd created with the Contract with America, welfare reform, Medicare reform, and the balanced budget. And a senior Senate leader said, no, Monica Lewinsky is going to win this election for us, and we don't need any ideas. And there's just a total sense of contempt. Why would you waste your time with ideas? And I took a long time to think about this, and it's, it's, it's fascinating because Lady Thatcher changed Great Britain but did not change the Conservative Party. And the day she left, it reverted to being the stupid party it had been before she was Prime Minister. President Reagan changed the world, defeated the Soviet Empire, relaunched the American economy, but did not change the core of the Republican Party. And the day he left, the old Republican Party, frankly, wiped out every Reaganite in the executive branch. Um, I had a very small group of people who understood what we did. Out of the total Republican majority of 236 at its peak, we might have had 20 who understood what we were doing. And the rest were just nice, pleasant people who were glad they were in the majority and thought this was really cool. I mean, you, get to be, you get to be called chairman, and it's kind of neat. But they didn't have a clue what we'd done. It's a very profound problem. I, a couple of years ago, I founded an organization called American Solutions because I decided that the crisis we were drifting towards was so much bigger than anything we were currently talking about. And the problem of rethinking our two parties was so much more profound that you really needed an organization that could do that. And I'll just give you just one brief thought that relates directly to Reagan's career. As I've gone through all of this, my conclusion has been that over the course of the American system since 1776, there have been two competing patterns. There's a party of the American people Sometimes it's Democrats, sometimes it's Republican. At one point it was the Jeffersonian uh, uh, Democratic Republicans. And there's the party of the elites and big government. Starting, you know, in, nine, in 98 or 99 or 2000, whatever you want to pick, the Republicans became the right wing of the party of the elites and big government. And you have the same problem in Sacramento. I mean, for this state to become healthy, you need a scale of change which it is inconceivable the current political structure can deliver. And so you're going to go through a period of pain until you finally decide to get serious. And frankly, the way you get serious in American history, and I, I commend to all of you, I had, we had did two books that, divide, that designed, when we sat down and designed the 94 campaign, which we designed in the summer of 93. We used two books. Remini's The Changing American Voter, which was a study of how Roosevelt brought out six million additional votes in 1936. Landon actually got a million more than Hoover got in 32, but he was drowned because Roosevelt got six million more. And it basically talked about how do you mobilize people who aren't used to voting. Well, if you look at the contract with America, we got nine million additional votes in 94, the largest one-party increase in an off year in American history, by design. Because we were positive, we had real solutions, and they were issues people believed in. The second book we used was fundamentally different. It is Remini's The Election of 1828. And it is the study of the Jacksonians who spend four years destroying John Quincy Adams. And they were serious about it. And I will just say to you from the first seven weeks of this administration, The Election of 1828 is a really useful book to read. Well, you talk about um, leadership in the Republican Party and I'm not going to get into um, who is uh, our up-and-coming leaders, but when you have a fractious Republican Party, how do you bring people together? Back in 1984, when you guys were doing the contract with America, you had um, a consolidated group. What would you recommend for the Republican Party to be able to bring everybody in the tent and move forward? Now, look, that, that's a good question, and my answer is I wouldn't. Uh, 1994 was a historically unique moment in which I had personally spent 16 years building a system. 
from, 19, from December of 1978 to November of 1994, 16 years. We lost in 80, 82, 84, 86, 88, 90, and 92. And then we won. It was a great week. Reagan, think about the film you watched. He splits the Republican Party in 1976. He runs against the incumbent Republican president. He comes within 70 votes of beating him in the convention. I mean, if you'd said to Reagan in the spring of 76, gosh, don't we need unity? He'd have said, no, we need clarity. Okay, so how do we get clarity? You get a lot of guys who get up and talk, okay? And I'll give you a, a politically incorrect example. We have had an argument over the last two weeks about whether or not it's appropriate to wish that the President of the United States failed. And I took a position which some conservatives find very confusing. I believe it is fundamentally wrong to desire the President of the United States to fail. I think it's perfectly appropriate to defeat the bad ideas. I think it's perfectly appropriate to hope the President will learn and change his position. But I remember how mad all of us got at the left when they wanted George W. Bush to fail. And I'm pretty happy to debate anybody in the conservative movement anywhere on the very core question. Do you as a citizen have an obligation to try to help the president? Now, you may need to help him by beating his dumb ideas and offering him better ideas. But your goal should be, because we, we can't have a permanent election. There are stretches when you have one person who's the commander in chief. And you have to try to help that guy work. And sometimes it's a steeper mountain than others. But I'll tell you, in my experience, it's sometimes as hard to get it to work on the Republican side as it is on the Democratic side. Bossy wants to ask a question. I don't know if I'd let him. <laughs> when I uh, met you briefly earlier today, I asked, did you ha think we could fix the Republican Party, or did you have some ideas on how to fix it? And you said, well, the right question, I think, this is paraphrasing it, is I think I know how to fix the country. Uh, right. What are the major ideas? What, you know, Reagan had three or four major ideas that he, he carried forward. Are there three or four that we should focus on now? Sure. I think some of them come straight out of this movie, which is an extraordinary film. And, you know, there's some parts of our values that are permanent. What were the founding fathers all about? They were about freedom. What was Lincoln trying to describe at Gettysburg? Freedom. What is Ronald Reagan describing? Freedom. There's a party which is willing to tolerate inequality if it leads to freedom. And there's a party which is willing to eliminate freedom if it leads to equality. Now, that's a pretty dramatic difference. So I would say, if, if, if I could define, and, and the point I tried to make earlier today, if I wasn't very articulate, was Republicans ought to quit worrying about the Republican Party and worry about America. California Republicans ought to quit worrying, you know. If California Republicans would quit worrying about the Republican Party and worry about California, the first thing that will happen is you'll meet a lot of new people. <laughs> there are a lot of other people in California who are worried about California. They'd love to find somebody to talk to. Just don't insist they come to a right-wing Republican meeting and immediately agree to whatever platform you adopted 11 years ago. But say together, what do we need to fix in Sacramento so our state's going to be healthy someday? You could be amazed how big your coalition could be. So my first advice to, from Michael Steele on down is quit thinking about the party. Think about America, think about your state, think about your community, think about your congressional district. If we fix that, people will hire us for a long time. Second, what Reagan understood and what Thatcher understood and what made them historic was that first principles are first principles. Now, lots of people give speeches. I know Obama is a good example of this. He, is, you know, he explained the other day while signing 9,000 earmarks that he was actually opposed to earmarks and he had a brand new idea for not signing earmarks, which he would announce shortly after signing the earmarks. <laughs> well, you know, let me just tell you, say it all. You don't have to take this stuff seriously. I mean, you just say, okay, got it, you're a politician. 
you are dramatically less than the candidate you promised us. That's fine. I get it. I'm not mad at him. It's just I don't think very much of that kind of behavior. But Reagan had a totally different style. I, I got involved in the Panama Canal fight, which Reagan led. And Reagan's willingness was to say, and, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a line in the Polish resistance movement, which we are, we're studying a lot right now to prepare to make this movie about Pope John Paul II. And during the decade-long struggle, the Poles had a, would say, two plus two equals four. And if the state tells you two plus two equals five, they're lying. And if they tell you two plus two equals three, they're lying. Now, let me give you an American example. If you can't afford to buy a house, <laughs> you can't afford to buy a house. Now, let's have, a, let's have an argument. Let's get it out in the open. The number one issue in America, actually there are three words that define politics for the next three years. Jobs, jobs, jobs. There's not a fourth word. This country is going to be in substantial pain. And the question is, which party is prepared to have an honest conversation with the American people, offer fundamental change, and win the argument? Margaret Thatcher, I'll close this up. Margaret Thatcher used to say, first you win the argument, then you win the vote. And we have to have the courage to win the argument. And it has to be an argument we believe in, and it has to be an argument that has consequences. All right, let's go right here. Uh, welcome tonight, and, and thank you for uh, the best movie I've seen on a Friday night in a long time. <laughs> can, can I stop and say I'm curious? How many of you, and I, and I don't want you to pander to us, but I think. Dave and Clifton, I'd be very curious, because obviously this is a very pro-Reagan group. How many of you think this is the best film you've seen on Reagan? I'm just going to share it. It's a, okay. um, on the drive over here, my wife and I were thinking of a question we wanted to ask you during this question time. And one of the concerns that we had is, how do we reach the youth of today, as we've seen the uh, other party, uh, reach the youth in large numbers. And I was wondering, you know, how are we going to reach the youth, get them to understand, you know, that when they vote and when they put themselves forward, that it has consequences for our country. But I'm a good listener, and I watched a great movie, and in that movie, it talked about from 76 to 1980, I believe, uh, President Reagan would go on the radio, and millions of people would hear him every week, and got to know who he was and what he stood for. And so my question is, is when are you going to start being on the radio? Well, let me work my way back to your first, more appropriate question. <laughs> By putting in a modest commercial that we have an uh, electronic newsletter at newt.org that goes out every week to about 820,000 people. Uh, I now Twitter and have about 10 or 12,000 people who follow that. Uh, I'm on Fox News reasonably often, which gives me probably not quite the reach that Governor Reagan got in the, in the 70s, but some reach. Uh, and we do uh, YouTubes and had five and a half million people watch our YouTubes last year. Uh, and then, of course, we do movies with Citizens United, which has certainly grown uh, dramatically and reaching out. So, you know, we're trying to educate. and We have some ideas for how we're going to dramatically expand that in the next six months. But I want to go back to your first question, because I, I think it's a great, and I want to show you, you know, I really feel, I mean, one of the reasons I'm so proud to be here is that I really feel that in many ways I stand on Reagan's shoulders. I, as a graduate student, I watched Reagan. We saw Lou Cannon the other night, and I was telling him I had read um, Ronnie and Jesse, which is the book he wrote in 1969. I think he was startled. But I, I began studying Reagan by the, from the time he ran for governor. And, and it's not that he's not the only person I've studied. I know a reasonable amount about FDR and Lincoln and those other guys. But there's a lot you can learn from Reagan. Let me give you three quick examples for young people that we've got to move towards. I was talking to somebody here tonight about, back to, uh, about a, a Kindle and whether or not you could use Kindles, which is a, the uh, Apple electronic device, I mean the uh, Amazon electronic device, 
uh, which will hold up to 200 books. Well, what if you gave a Kindle to students? What if, what if college students, instead of paying bizarre prices for, for absurdly overpriced textbooks, often assigned by the professor who wrote them? With a liberal slant. With a liberal slant. What if, what if you could reduce the cost of going to college by $500 to $1,000 a year by offering them the option of having electronic books? What if you were to, here's a simple principle to apply if you're running short of money in Sacramento. Look at the number of administrators per student on campuses in 1950. And then look at the number of administrators on campuses today and simply apply the 1950 model. Now that would require you then go to your congressional delegation to point out that the federal government has added probably 70 times the number of administrators to fill out the federal forms. But we're not going to change things, because so you, you want to be able to go back to students and say, I'd like to be able to make it possible for you to learn as early as possible, to get educated as inexpensively as possible, and to have the best possible life. The, the other two quick examples are, uh, if, if you know, the president's budget has an energy, an energy tax in it, if you go to young people and say, hi, how would you like to pay $1,300 a year per family uh, extra for electricity, heating, oil, and gasoline? You'll find relatively few young people who go, you know, I've been making so much money recently and this economy, this economy is so good I can hardly stand the opportunity. Please let me pay that extra 1300 The other thing you could do is you could figure out what is the lifetime cost to a 20-year-old of the budget deficits of this year and just hand them a bill. And say, this is what these guys, you start thinking about interest rates going up and what that will do to federal debt cost. You know, you could begin to have a conversation radically different than any conversation you think you're going to have. And you're going to find a lot of young people are pretty smart. They figure out, start, first of all, most of them have credit cards. And they figured out at some point you actually want them to pay for it. And so they begin to move into conservatism inch by inch. All right, we'll take one more because we have um, to sign some CDs. The young man here. No, you. This way. There you go. There you go. Speaking of youth. Um, thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm, I was just curious. I'll be able to vote in uh, 2012 for the first time for president. And I was curious if I'll be able to find your name on the ballot. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't set him up for that. <laughs> and, and also, I was wondering, who do you think are some of the emerging conservative leaders that could be some of our future conservatives that could lead our country in the near future? Well, let me say first of all, I wondered when you called on your nephew why you had picked him to be the last <laughs> question. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I gave an accurate but probably not very clever answer the other night uh, when I was in uh, Virginia. Uh, with a local reporter, and I said that Clist and I will probably uh, meet with our children and grandchildren in January of 2011 and have this conversation, which promptly became Gingrich's thinking about running. So I want to give you a totally different answer. Um, I believe, and I said this a while ago, this is the greatest economic challenge in 80 years. There is no one alive today who is in a position of authority when we totally failed twice. We failed to stop the Great Depression, and we failed to fix it. And people tend to forget, FDR was a great politician. He was terrible at economics. We had 15% unemployment in 1939. That is not a very desirable decade. And so the commitment I've made, and the list that I've made is, I'm going to do everything I can this year, everything to try to help this country on a totally nonpartisan basis find the best possible solutions to get us out of the hole we're in. And and I haven't campaigned much since 1998, but I will do everything I can in 2010 to beat people in both parties who refuse to help build a better future. And I will help recruit. <laughs> I 
And I'm prepared to try to help recruit Democrats in districts that are hold completely Democrat, because I think you can find common sense, anti-tax, serious Democrats in districts that are currently occupied by left-wingers who will be shocked to discover that they don't have an easy ride because they can beat a Republican. They suddenly have to go back home and defend inside their own party why they are totally out of touch with reality. And I believe the pain level we're going to be in by this summer is so great that this country is going to pay more attention than at any time in my lifetime, and it is going to be ready for a serious conversation. And I believe the, the politicians will never get it. But the country will understand that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and we owe it to our children and our grandchildren and our country to have the guts to follow the consequence of that, and then to do what it takes to have a growing economy, a balanced budget, a government that works, a nation that is safe, and the maximum opportunity to create the best jobs in the world in the United States. And we're going to do that from now and through 2010. And then we'll be glad to come back here and have a seminar sometime in early 2011 on the many opportunities that life has. Thank you all very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Newt Gingrich. And Calista. He was the writer and director. And our bosses. And, oh, and the boss. <laughs> and I'd like to thank my producer. Thank you, everybody. So what we're going to do now, we're going to uh, take the podium off. He's going to be up here to uh, sign, or they are going to be up here to sign. If you form the line off to my left and be a little bit patient, we'll open the doors to get some cool air in here. And thank you all for joining us this evening. <laughs>